Well, I am thankful to have the opportunity to share God's Word, to preach God's Word, uh, despite the circumstances not being uh, ideal for us normally. It is still a privilege, and we have to count ourselves blessed because even in the context of uh, human history, church history, uh, there have been very few churches and very few pastors who've had the ability and the opportunity uh, to be able to do it this way, even in the midst of trial. And so I am grateful that we have this opportunity. And so this morning, we're going to look at what it means for us to follow Jesus. What does it mean for us to follow Jesus? I think oftentimes Christianity is characterized by very different kinds of terms. Uh, We think about conversion. We think about the new birth experience. Uh, Some folks will like to say that they've made a decision for Christ or more passively that they were converted, um, became a Christian, or uh, started having a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, all of those sentiments contain an element of truth, of orthodoxy, but there is one distinguishing mark that is the most vibrant mark of Christianity, of biblical Christianity. And that is the notion that Christians are followers of Jesus Christ. And while there are numerous calls for people in the Gospels to believe, to believe, repent and believe, there are also numerous calls to follow Jesus. And so as we're going to see in our study this morning, the disciples are not given a choice to believe, rather they are commanded to follow And so with that, we turn in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 4. And so turn with me to Matthew chapter 4. We're going to continue in our study. We're not going to take any kind of a break. We're not going to change the circumstances here. Uh, We're going to continue to move ahead because we believe the Lord has this for us. Last time we looked at Matthew 4, verses 12 through 17, and we were looking at the beginning of Jesus' Galilean ministry. Uh, Christ does not go back to Galilee for no reason. He doesn't do this uh, haphazardly, traveling back to his his home region, to the city of Capernaum. He's moving now and transitioning his ministry to that area. Everything he does, uh, articulated in the scriptures, everything he does is by divine design. And in this case, for the fulfillment of direct biblical prophecy. Isaiah had foretold that the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali would be the recipients of a great light, that they would, be, they would behold the sun. And Isaiah calls him the wonderful counselor, mighty God, eternal father, prince of peace. And although they had lived in great darkness for centuries, they would soon walk in light. And then in the fullness of time, Jesus moves into town. Look at verse 23. Verse 23, Jesus was going all throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. So he's preaching, he's teaching, he's healing, he's displaying the light and the life of heaven to all the peoples. There wasn't a single person who came to him that was not healed and didn't behold and embrace uh, some measure of his teaching. They heard him preach. They listened to him. What was he preaching? Look at verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And we, we talked about last time how that was his message, them. It was John the Baptist's message. It's the Apostle Peter's message. It's our message. We call all people everywhere to repent And trust in Jesus Christ. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so he's preaching here. He's preaching repentance. He's he's preaching that people should, should turn from their sins and confess them to God. And he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom. The good news from heaven that Jesus has come to earth as the king and died to pay for the sins of his people. He has, as Colossians 1.13 and 14 says, delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in which he has, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And so we are to be saved by Jesus Christ is to have forgiveness for your sins and to have eternal life granted to you by God. That's the very core essence of the gospel, that we have salvation in the form of a person. Jesus reconciling and saving sinners and bringing them to himself, redeeming them, buying them back. 
Our message is not a message of condemnation, even though our sin brings about condemnation, but our message is a message of hope. It's a message to all the world, today, last week, tomorrow, forever, the message of hope that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And everywhere that Jesus goes, he's preaching this gospel. However, as he went, he's encountering various people. He's bumping into all kinds of people as he travels. And in the providence of God, he's making his home in Capernaum. Capernaum, And Jesus is intending, as he's there, to call several men to become his disciples. And so this morning we look at Matthew 4, 18 to 22. Look at this with me. Now, as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately, they left the boat and their father and followed him. Now, these verses give us a window into a more dynamic calling. There's certainly more going on here than just a casual conversation. We're not just listening in on a very quick uh, exchange here. This is not just uh, laissez-faire. These are four men who are about to have their lives changed forever. But this morning, I want to tell you where I'm going. We are going to first look at both encounters. So we're going to look at the first encounter with Peter and Andrew. Then we're going to look at the second encounter with James and John. But then we're going to do a little bit more than that. We're going to look at what it means and what Jesus intends by follow me. What does that mean to follow Jesus, And then we're going to see what following Jesus looks like, and more specifically, what it costs, what it costs to follow Jesus. But let's first just look at the text, and we're going to kind of work from the, from the inside out. We're going to go at the text first, and then we're going to draw out application as we go. So let's look at t- together at the first encounter that consists of Peter and Andrew. Matthew records here that Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, and he saw two brothers, Peter and Andrew, Uh, Galilee is the region, Uh, the Sea of Galilee is the body of water that's right there smack dab in the middle, and there are nine cities, as we saw last time, around the Sea of Galilee. Uh, Capernaum is one of them, it's a a hub, it's a fishing village, and so there would have been fishermen everywhere. Uh, Josephus, who's a Jewish historian, even says that uh, they believe that as many as 260 boats could actually be on this sea fishing at one time, and so this is a this is a hap- happen in place here, and this is a, a, fishing, uh, a fishing area, a fishing village. So that's where he's walking. All these people are hustling and bustling around. They're, they're conducting their trade, and Jesus is walking by, and he sees these two men. Now, it would almost seem coincidental or even happenstance, but it's not. It's not. Again, in the providence of God, Jesus is meant to encounter these men. And in fact, Jesus may have ventured to this location looking for these men. We don't know. But certainly, this is in the divine prerogative. In the end, we know that it's true. He does encounter them. He sees them, and he has a purpose for them. And the first one, Simon, who is called Peter, and then we're going to see Andrew, his brother. Now, we know who these men are. If you've read the Bible or read the Gospels at all, you've seen these men, you know who they are. But we also know from the the context of all of Scripture that Jesus had previously met both of these men. Actually, turn with me to John chapter 1. We see this encounter in John chapter 1. The Gospel of John, written by the Apostle John, it it was written uh, several years after the Gospel of Matthew, certainly to fill out some of the information that the Lord believed was lacking up to that point. But we we meet Andrew before we meet Peter in John chapter 1. At this point in the gospel, John the Baptist, who is separate from from John the disciple, but John the Baptist had not yet been arrested. He's still ministering. And we read about here in John chapter 1, starting in verse 35. The next day, John, John the Baptist, was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. 
And Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which is translated teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come and you will see. And so they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. The one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And he found first his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which translated means Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. And so back up a little bit. First we meet Andrew. Andrew, and he is also with John. We believe he's with John. They leave their uh, teacher, John the Baptist, in order to follow Jesus to his dwelling place. And they want to learn more about him. Now, after they realize who he is or what they they have come to believe about Jesus, now they're going to learn a lot more about Jesus in the future, but once they realize who he is, Andrew, who if you look at the scriptures, is always bringing people to Jesus, Andrew cannot keep it to himself. Andrew has to tell other people, and who's the person he's going to go to first and tell that he's found the Messiah? He's going to go to his brother, his brother, Simon Peter. We read about this in verse 41. Uh, He says, he found first his his own brother, Simon, and said to him, we have found the Messiah. We found the Christ, we found the anointed one, we found the one that we've been waiting for in Israel for years. He is here. Now notice that it says, He first went to his own brother. He's the first person he wants to go to. He's the closest to him. Verse 42, he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John, and you shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. So Andrew believes that he's found the Messiah. He wants to tell his brother. He brings his brother to him. And then Jesus proceeds to give Simon a new name. Can you imagine that? You meet someone for the first time, and within the first few minutes of your encounter, they change your name, or they give you a new nickname. It's, it's quite curious. If you know the course of biblical history, God is always giving names and changing names and giving new identity. And that's what Jesus does even here with Peter. He says, you will be called Cephas, which is Peter, and the translation of that really is stone or rock. So according to John, which was written several years, like I said, probably several decades before Matthew's gospel, it's actually Jesus who gives Simon his name, Peter. And yet Matthew, in his gospel, assumes that everybody in that day would have known this, they would have known who Peter was, and so he would have been right. Go back to Matthew. Go back to Matthew. So Jesus is in Capernaum, the hometown of Simon Peter and Andrew, And he's walking along the course of the sea, and he sees them. And what are they doing? What are are Simon Peter and Andrew doing? Well, Matthew says they're casting a net into the sea, and then he adds, because they're fishermen. That's what fishermen do. They they stand either on a boat or on shore or even waist deep in the water, and they're throwing nets and they're catching fish, and that's what they do for a living. That's how they conduct their trade. And that's what they're doing even then. Now, we believe that at least seven of the disciples were fishermen. And certainly that included Peter and Andrew, and as we're going to see, James and John. But they would have not necessarily been small-time fishermen. They weren't, uh, oftentimes you see a lot of the biblical art of just kind of these ragtag guys with like a single net, you know, sort of beaten down. I mean, these men were probably business owners. Now, I don't want to go too far with that, but Peter, we know that Peter owned a boat. He had a boat. He lived in Capernaum, which is a major fishing village. Uh, He lived there with his wife. He had a house there. He built a life around this sprawling fishing community. People would have known who he was. And Andrew very well could have been his business partner. We always see them together whenever they're working, whenever they're traveling. They're always together. And so this was not just a, I, I can't find anything better to do, so I guess I'll become a fisherman. This is their life. This is their passion. In fact, after Three years is up and Jesus goes and and dies on the cross and resurrects. And then uh, we find them traveling out and going fishing again. That's where they go back to their old trade because that's what they know. But regardless of all that, this is a serious venture for them. And when Jesus sees them as he's walking, he knows them and they certainly recognize him. They've met him before. Remember, Andrew, you have to keep this in your mind, Andrew believes that he's the Messiah. That hasn't changed. Andrew believes he's the Messiah. 
But the question is, well, why are they fishing right now? If Andrew thinks that Jesus is the Messiah, why hasn't he been following him? Well, you've got to remember in the context of the story, there's a lot going on. There's a lot going on. Keeping in mind that, that Jesus had been gone for at least six weeks in the wilderness. He had gone out to be tempted by the devil. He would reigned victorious. And, and it's even longer if you consider the time of travel in between. So this might have been several weeks, possibly even several months since they've last seen him. They would have had nothing else to do except go back to their business venture. They would have gone back to their trade of fishing. But it becomes clear that Jesus is now calling them to leave their business and follow him full time. And seeing them in the water, casting their nets, Jesus says to them in verse 19, verse 19, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Now, there's a lot bound up in this verse, and we're going to look at that shortly. But how do they respond when Jesus calls them away from their business, away from their livelihood to follow him? How do they respond? Look at verse 20. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. This is important. Immediately. Now, practically speaking, they, they stop what they're doing. Okay? They, they stop dead in their tracks. Now, some have read into this and said, well, they just dropped their nets on the ground and walked away. That certainly could have been. However, they also could have either put them away or sold them or set them aside. or We don't know the time frame, but the idea is, is that they didn't drag their feet for days or weeks or months or possibly even hours. They stopped what they were doing, collected their things, got up, and they followed Jesus. They ceased being fishermen in that moment, and they immediately became followers of Jesus Christ. And then we move on to the second encounter, verses 21 and 22, the encounter of James and John. Look at verse 21. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. I want to keep this in mind that they're still in Capernaum. They're still on the Sea of Galilee, and so James and John live in the same town as Peter and Andrew. This is the same area. James and John, we learn about later in the Gospels, they're called by nickname the Sons of Thunder, and they become Jesus' two most uh, dynamic disciples, certainly. They're always doing uh, pretty uh, boisterous things. But here, we see them as fishermen, and they're with their father, Zebedee. Now, Mark's gospel, if you were to read Matthew and Mark together, look at the parallel accounts. Mark's gospel includes that there were also hired hands working with them. So it's, uh, it's James and John, they're with their father Zebedee, and there are other, other people that are hired to work along this business. And so this is not just, again, a ragtag business. There are several people working in this industry, on these boats, under this man Zebedee. And as he encounters them, the Bible says that they're mending their nets. They're mending their nets. They're preparing them right now. They're pulling out all the, the weeds and all the whatever the stuff is stuck in the nets from the previous catch. They're preparing their nets to go out and fish. And Jesus encounters them at that moment. And verse 21 says that he called them. He called them. Well, how did he call them? It's very likely he called them in the exact same way he called Peter and Andrew. He very well could have said, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Just like Peter and Andrew, I'm going to do the same with you. Follow me. Follow me. Verse 22, what happens? Same thing. Immediately, they left the boat and their father, and they followed him. Just like with the other two, Matthew records that they leave their vocation immediately, immediately to follow Jesus. Now again, these two accounts seem pretty straightforward and seemingly uneventful. I mean, if you just kind of look at the scene in your mind, Jesus is walking down the street, he sees the first two men, he says, stop what you're doing, follow me, goes a little bit farther down the street, sees two other guys and says, follow me, and they go. That seems pretty straightforward. However, we know better. We know better. From the course of biblical history, from the course of all of church history, we know that this is a titanic moment. Whereas before, their following of Jesus was voluntary, temporary, and sort of casual. Now, this is a call to follow Jesus. This is a paradigm shift in their life, in their vocation, in their commitment. This is a change in everything. From this day forward, for these men, everything 
is going to be different. And in fact, some commentators of this gospel even add or note that this is the point where we see the birth of Christian mission. Some people believe that the birth of the church comes in Acts. I would tend to agree with that. But really, if you look at the, the very kernel, the, the essential element, the very first point, the seed of Christian mission begins here when Jesus calls his very first disciples. So everything in the course of human history has changed at this point. Now you see the God-man, Jesus Christ, coming down to earth, walking. He's already been proved and verified as the Messiah, as the King of creation. It's been testified. He goes out and he calls the very first disciple to come and follow him. It's really an earth-shattering event. And Jesus begins this life, this call, with the words, follow me. And so for the time remaining, I want to explore what this means. What does it mean to follow Jesus? When he says, follow me, what is he commanding? Well, I want to, I want to approach two questions here for the time we have remaining. And the first question is, what does it mean to follow Jesus? And two, what will it cost or what does it cost to follow Jesus? Jesus. But let's look at number one here. What does Jesus mean when he says, follow me? The concept of following Jesus is pervasive in the Gospels. It's everywhere. In fact, even in Matthew's Gospel alone, if you were just to do a word search, it appears 26 times in Matthew alone. Now, some of those uh, references are just for a physical following or even a textual gloss but many of the references and a vast majority of the references are, are in, uh, in conjunction with people actually following Jesus physically or following his way, being called to follow him as a disciple. But what does it mean for someone to follow Jesus? Now, admittedly, as I thought through it, there's a lot that could be said. There's a lot that this entails. And I just want to make a note that James Boyce, who is a, a pastor, passed away in the year 2000, but... James Boyce, in his commentary, he actually notes five markers of what it means to follow Christ. And that was actually very helpful and it's kind of formulating my thinking. But for our purposes today, I want, to, I want to explore really four key truths of what it means to follow Christ. Four key truths. Number one, what does it mean to follow Jesus? Number one, it's obedience to the gospel. It's obedience to the gospel. It's very interesting in 2 Thessalonians 1.7, it articulates the future reality that Jesus Christ is going to come and judge, the Bible says, those who do not obey the gospel. It's a very interesting way to put it. God is going to come in the person of Christ at the second coming to judge and condemn those who do not obey the gospel. Well, how do you obey the gospel? Well, the gospel presents good news. It presents the message of salvation and offers salvation through the cross of Christ. And so in response to that news, to respond to the gospel, to obey the gospel is to believe. It's not just a a haphazard thing. It's not just like, well, that sounds good. I guess I'll do that. It's more than that. It's a command. When you're presenting the gospel, when I preach the gospel to you, this is not just a suggestion. I think it would be a good idea for you to repent of your sins and turn to Christ. That's never the call for faithfulness in preaching or faithfulness in testimony. No, the call is always a command. You're impelling people. You're imploring people. You're exhorting people. Not because you're the arbiter of truth yourself, but because God has commanded the sin is the problem, Christ is the solution, and if you don't turn to Christ, you will die. This is life and death. And so the command is to repent and to believe the gospel. And so to obey the gospel is to believe on Christ for salvation. And so therefore, to follow Jesus in faith is to believe in him unto eternal life. In fact, several times, Jesus puts it in these terms specifically. For example, in Luke 9.23, Luke 9.23, Jesus tells his followers, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Follow me. And then he adds, for whoever wishes to save his life shall lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. So Jesus, in verse 24 of Luke 9, 
puts it in these terms. He puts it in these terms. Following me is a matter of life or death. Either you're going to save your life or you're going to lose your life. But it's counterintuitive. And what he says here in verse 24 is if you're trying to save your own life by your own efforts and your own deeds and your own morality and your own standard, he says you're going to invariably lose your life. But he says, if you lose your life, if you die to yourself and take up your cross and follow me, if you die to yourself, then you will save your own life because you believed on me who is the Savior. So Jesus says, it's life or death, Christ or self. There's only two gods in the equation. Either you make yourself your own God and you damn yourself, or you believe on the one true God who is Jesus Christ and you live. And so Jesus is commanding people to die to themselves and by faith to follow after him unto eternal life. This is nothing short of believing the gospel and responding in faith and in godliness. And so to follow Christ is to believe in him and to trust him for life. And so you must, and I would command anyone who's listening to the sound of my voice, you must Turn from your sins and follow Jesus. And to follow Jesus, you must trust him and believe in him. And you will have life. Number two, following Christ. This is very similar and kind of works together with number one. But number two, following Christ means repentance of sin. Repentance of sin. In Ephesians 2, 2, the Apostle Paul takes, uh, talks about the, the common experience of non-believers And he addresses the church. He says, you were dead. He's talking to Christians. You used to be dead in your your trespasses and your sins. And then he says this, following the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, you used to follow Satan. You used to follow the world. And therefore you were dead. 1 Timothy 5.15 notes the error of those who have turned aside to follow Satan. Hebrews 4.11 warns about following those who are examples of disobedience. 2 Peter 2 warns of following false teachers in their sensuality. Following the way of Balaam. Following after their own lusts. And so death for people, for those who reject Christ, who reject the gospel, are those who are following after the course of the world, following their own flesh, following their own lusts, following in disobedience, even following Satan. All of us are followers of something or someone. And so the way of wickedness is apparent. It consists of following your own sinful desires. And that's what people do in their flesh. They do what's right in their own mind. They do whatever feels good, whatever feels like it's fun. They follow themselves. They follow their heart, which is terrible advice. Don't follow your heart. Your heart will only kill you. But following Christ, following Christ is a rejection of all that. It's a rejection of that. Following Christ means forsaking sin and forsaking the course of this world. There's a a stark contrast. If you listen to the words of Paul and the words of Jesus, Paul's saying, look, in sin, you used to follow the world. Jesus says, follow me. It's living a life of repentance. Repentance. Repentance of your sins and a turning toward Christ in godliness. Number three, following Christ means submission. Submission, it means yielding your own life to his righteous way. It means you take direction, you take your cues, you take your commands from Christ. Christ is the boss. It means that you learn from him and you seek to understand him. It's saying, I don't want to be the captain of my own life. I can't be. Because whenever I take the wheel, I steer off into the cliffs and I die. Every time. Whenever we do what is right in our own eyes, we invariably fail. We might make small temporal gains. But in the end, if you're just living for yourself, you're not living at all. But submitting to Christ means acknowledging His Lordship. This is an issue of lordship. In Matthew 16, 24, Jesus told the disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. This is not about you. 
This is not about me. This is not about me doing what is best for me. This is about death to self. This is about denying self and living to Christ. You have a new, a new master, a new Lord. He says furthermore in Matthew 10.38, He who does not, I want you to listen to this, He who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Jesus, he doesn't pull any punches. He says you have to. If you don't deny yourself and follow me, you have no part with me. He doesn't want casual followers. He doesn't want casual Christians. I'll tell you, this crisis right now is going to test the mettle of a lot of people. Do you really follow Jesus? Or is church and religion just a thing you do? Is it an add-on? Is it a, a label on your Facebook page? Or is this a way of life? I'll tell you, this is testing the mettle of a lot of people, myself included, where Jesus is looking at us, in, even in this capacity, and saying, do you really love me? Do you love me enough that even though you don't have all the trappings of your normal life, even though you don't have the creature comforts of Sunday morning, of Wednesday uh, small group, or whatever it may be, even though someone isn't nagging you and pulling you in, what are you doing with your time? Are you still in the Word? Are you still in prayer? Are you still devoted to your family? Has a crisis changed your allegiance? How are you at home? With your family? With your spouse? With your friends? With your neighbors? Friends, this is a radical call by Jesus to forsake yourself and follow after Him. This is more than the bumper sticker. What would Jesus do? This is, this is way more. This is what did Jesus do and what does Jesus command? Let me tell you, if you embrace humility, if you're humble, this becomes a lot easier to say, yes, Lord. But if you're prideful, self-willed, self-important, this becomes extremely difficult. Jesus told the rich young ruler in Matthew 19, 21, if you wish to be complete, he tells him, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. You want life? You want purpose? You want salvation? You want eternal life? Get rid of it all. Now, Jesus is not calling us to literally sell every single thing and go into poverty. But for this man who these things actually owned and possessed and controlled him, for this man, Jesus was saying, go and sell everything. Jesus might be saying something very different in your, your situation. But the bottom line is that whatever this looks like, Jesus is commanding a death to self. This is not about you. This is not about me anymore. He's saying, deny yourself. Deny yourself. This young man couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. The Bible says that he, he hung his head and turned away and left miserable. He couldn't do it. Why not? Because this rich young ruler was his own Lord. And he would not submit himself to the Lordship of Christ. What he was essentially saying to Jesus is, my stuff, my status, my position is worth more to me than following you. I can't do it. And it made him miserable. He recognized his own condition. I pray that he repented at some point later on in his life and turned and followed Jesus. I really do. I would love to see the rich young ruler in heaven as a poor, old servant. <laughs> I really would. But this man couldn't do it. But we are commanded to, we're called to, to yield to Jesus in submission of our life. Number four. Number four, and lastly, following Christ is conformity to His way of life. It's conformity to His way of life. It's what we mean when we say Christ-likeness. What is Christ like? Well, we see the way He is displayed in the Scriptures. We, see the, we read the epistles and read His life, His doctrine, His actions, His commands, His law. We see Jesus. And if you know Jesus, you know Him personally. He lives within you by way of the Holy Spirit. And so, 
It means that you're seeking to live your life in such a way that reflects Christ and honors Christ. What would Jesus have me do? What does He command? How does He want me to live? What does He want me to say? How does He want me to act? What does He want me to believe? Jesus says this much in John 8, 12. He said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness. Walking in darkness means living in debauchery, in wickedness, and in shame. But rather, Jesus says that His followers who walk in Him will have the light of life. The life that is lived in the light. No guilt, no shame, in righteousness. Romans 6 says we we no longer become slaves to sin, we actually become slaves to righteousness. That's actually a good kind of slavery. Where your whole life is conformed and controlled by righteous things. By righteous thoughts and deeds and words and actions and affections. Where your heart's desire, even though imperfectly, your heart's desire is for righteousness, for godliness. Lord, I hate my sin, but I love you. I want to do the things that please you. Because I'm your slave, I belong to you. That's what this is. It means you speak like Christ, you love like Christ, you act like Christ, and you serve like Christ. Serve like Christ? Yes. John 12, 26, anyone who serves me must follow me. And wherever I am, there my servant will be also. And anyone who serves me, my Father will honor him. He says, you want to be like me, you have to serve like me. You got to love like me. John 13, 34, new commandment I give you to love one another just as I have loved you. So you must love one another. And if you do that, other people will see you. They'll see that you're my disciples. And they'll give glory to God. It's a life of service. It's a life of submission to Christ. And even as we seek to imitate others in their walk, and we want to do that, we want to follow godly examples, that's, that's right. But what we're doing when we follow godly examples is we're ultimately seeking Christ's likeness. Paul said, excuse me, Paul said, to follow me as I follow Christ. Paul's not saying... Do everything I do without judgment. Because in the ways that Paul sinned, he's not saying do like me. He says, follow me as I follow Christ. When you see Christ's likeness in me, follow that. Philippians 3.17, brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. Follow people who follow Christ. Find the most godly, Christ-like person you possibly can and imitate their life in all godliness. And when they sin, watch how they repent and do likewise. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.10, follow my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, and perseverance. And he says also persecutions and sufferings. If you're going to follow me in Christ's likeness, you're going to suffer like me because I suffer like Christ. Christ was persecuted. Christ was made fun of. Christ was made nothing in this life. He suffered hardship. Many of you are suffering hardship right now. Many more of you will suffer hardship in the future. And here's the thing. When culture eventually turns on us for good, I read an article this week actually blaming evangelical Christians for the virus. And for the response to the virus, it's our fault somehow. They did this back in Nero's time. Nero fiddled while Rome burned. And the Christians were blamed for it. The Christians were blamed for setting the fire that burned down all the city. So this is nothing new. If you're surprised that we're being blamed for a crisis, welcome to church history. It doesn't matter in the end, though, because even Christ was persecuted. And Jesus said to his disciples in John's gospel, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. If you were of the world, they would love you as their own. But because you're not of the world, and I've called you to follow me out of the world, therefore the world hates you, and they will. Even Peter noted this in 1 Peter 2.21, for you have been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example to follow in His steps. Christ has called us to suffer with Him. 
If any of you suffers as a sinner, if you suffer because you're being nasty to other people, if you're suffering because of your own sins and your own flaws and your own mistakes, well, that's on you. But if you suffer as a Christian in godliness and in righteousness, if you take a stand for morality, if you take a stand for Jesus, and you suffer, blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who are persecuted for me, Jesus says. We're going we're gonna to be there in a couple weeks. So in your life, in your speech, in your conduct, in your love, what about in the mission? What about in the mission? Jesus told Peter and Andrew, two fishermen, he said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. He's talking about soul winning. He's talking about evangelism. Whereas Jesus called people to himself, we call all people to follow Jesus. We say look to him and follow him. Well, this leads us really to our last question, our last question this morning. What is this going to cost us as we go and tell people to follow Jesus and we ourselves follow Jesus and we become fishers of men and catch people and say, go to Christ, go to Christ. What is it going to cost? Well, it's interesting if you look at Matthew 4. In Jewish culture and tradition, this is very interesting, Rabbis did not choose their own disciples. The disciples chose the rabbi. They would find some rabbi that they liked, some celebrity rabbi in the synagogue. They would find some teacher, and they would, they would love him, and they'd say, we're going to follow that guy. And they would go, and they'd take all their things, and they'd gather up their life, and they would go follow their teacher for as long as they wanted to. So rabbis never chose their own disciples. But here, we see that flipped on its head. Jesus, who is the rabbi, the teacher... He goes out and he selects who he wants to follow him. It's countercultural. It's counterintuitive. But Jesus calls them, as he sees them, he calls them to lose their lives and to follow him. And what did they do? Well, Peter and Andrew, they left their nets and they followed him. They just dropped their nets and they followed him. In the same way, James and John, they left their boat. And their father, the boat and the nets, that represents their business. That's their livelihood. That's their security. You'd be like saying to a carpenter, drop your tools and follow me. It'd be like saying to a, a seminary student, drop your books and follow me. Drop everything. Stop what you're doing and follow me. That's your livelihood. That's your security. That's your industry. But notice that James and John... They also leave their father. They leave their father. And I suspect that was even harder to do. Because that's family. That's family. Anybody can find a new job. But not everybody can find a new dad. How do you leave your father, whom you're studying under and who you're working under, the family business? How do you do that? Well, by noting these things, what Matthew was including in his text here, this is represent, representing the totality of life. Your job, your security, your industry, and your family, all that together, that's really the sum of who we are as people on earth. In fact, Jesus said in Luke fourteen twenty six, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, He cannot be my disciple. What does he mean? What does he mean, hate my father, hate my mother? What does that mean? Well, in that context, it is hyperbole. But the message is abundantly clear. Nobody and nothing must take the prime seat in your heart. No other God on the altar of your heart. It must be Christ and no other. That's it. And by comparison, to love Christ must be so strong that every other affection toward any other person feels like hatred. But hyperbole aside, hyperbole aside, you must be faced with some of these decisions. And this is an issue of allegiance. Allegiance. 
And let me tell you, if you have to choose between Jesus Christ and some other thing, you must be prepared to hate that other thing. Maybe a loved one comes to you one day and says, it's either me or Jesus. And if you think I'm being facetious or exaggerating this, I've talked to many people who that's what it comes down to. Someone in their life says, look, all you do is spend time with the church. All you do is read your Bible. All you do is talk about Jesus and look, Look, I'm sick of it. It's either Jesus or me. And the person is forced to make a decision. A decision that rips out their guts, but they have to do it. And notice that we're not the ones who are calling for this, because we're called to love one another. We're called to love people who don't love Christ. We're called to love our spouse and love our kids and love our family, love our neighbor. And so this doesn't originate with us. Because if we could love all people and love Christ and have that work, we would do it, right? But when someone comes to you or when there's an idol in your heart and you're forced to make that decision, what are you going to do? And when someone says, either Jesus or me, you must be prepared to say Christ alone. Christ alone. There can be no other. There can be no other. Because only Christ can save you. Only Christ can sustain you and fill you and sanctify you. My marriage can't redeem me. My kids can't redeem me. My friendships, as great as they are, they can't satisfy and sustain me and sanctify me. Only Christ can. Only Christ holds the keys to the future. This is a very real thing. In fact, in Mark 10, 38, Peter, the disciple we're reading about here, Peter comes to the Lord and he says, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. We've left everything, Lord, and followed you. So much so that even in John 6, when the other disciples are running away and leaving him, Jesus turns to his disciples, his closest ones, and says, are you going to, fall? Are you going to go away too? And what do they say? Where can we go? We, we have nowhere else to go. You have the words of eternal life. In essence, he's saying, we've left everything and followed you. We've lost it all, Lord. Where else can we go? And what did Jesus say? He replied, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but shall he receive a hundred times as much now in the present age and in the age to come. You might say, Lord, I've left everything. I've given up everything to follow you. And Jesus says, I will give you a hundred times more. Perhaps now in this life? And what does that look like? Well, some of you have left family. Some of you have been rejected by family. Some of you, your spouse has rejected you because of your faith. Some of you, and I know this to be true, even in this congregation, some of you, your kids don't want to talk to anymore because of your faith. They don't want to hear about it anymore. And so you've lost your children, you've lost your family, you've lost friendships. Many of you have lost friends. Some of you have lost parents. Your parents have rejected you because of Christ. So how does Jesus satisfy this? And this pains me to say, even in this context, even though it's true, that Christ has given us the church. He's given us the assembly. And I already miss the days when we're together in one place. But I know that we are bound together in Christ. That all of my brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and children will be with me and will be with you forever. And in our church, in Harvest Bible Church, 
We have received a hundred times the number of mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters. Many of you have been helped by the benevolence we've given to each other. We've served one another. You've been at my house. I've been at your house. We've eaten together. We've prayed together. We've cried together. We have already received, not even in the kingdom yet. We're not even in heaven yet. We've already received a hundredfold of what we have lost in this life. Count your blessings. Love the body. Love the church. Pray for one another. Lift each other up in prayer. Call each other on the phone. Tell each other you love each other right now while we have the chance. Jesus is so right. He's so right. He says, you shall receive a hundred times in the present age and then dot, 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 and in the age to come. If this is our life here with the assembly, how much more will it be in heaven with Him, with all the redeemed in Christ? What is life now without Christ? Nothing. But what is a little hardship now in this life with Christ and Christ in eternity? Everything. Everything. My friends, follow Christ in the obedience of faith, in repentance, in submission, in conformity to righteousness. Follow Christ and you will not walk in darkness, but you will have the light of life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we know that your word is true. We know that what you say is true. That you have commanded us to follow you. And Lord, we know that there will be hardship. We know that there will be suffering. We know that it won't always be easy. And Father, you, you see even this crisis right now very clearly. You see how difficult this is. How we've been separated from one another. You see, Lord, the trial. You see the fear that people have around the world, but even in this country, even in our own towns. But God, you have called us to follow and to lose our life to follow you and promise that we will gain everything. And so I pray, Lord, that even now we will take this call seriously. That we will stop feeling sorry for ourselves and die to ourselves and come to you. Lord, we accept the discipline. We accept the chastening. We accept a little affliction now. Because we know that in this, it is producing in us the eternal weight of glory. And so help us, Lord, to die to ourselves, to lose our lives, to follow after Jesus. May this be the heartbeat of our life. We ask this in faith, in Christ. Amen.